So we are now joined by Clayton Aldern. He is a journalist and a data scientist and also co-author with Greg Colburn of the new book, Homelessness is a Housing Problem. Clayton, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jen. So uh, you have obviously written a new book about homelessness with Greg Colburn, and I want to just start by putting homelessness into context, uh, because as you guys point out in your book, it's obviously this very contentious issue that, you know, generates a lot of sort of hyper-partisan responses and um, actually seems like it's going to be kind of a major issue in quite a few political fights and elections that we see coming up, uh, specifically in California, but also elsewhere. Um, and, you know, there, there are really a lot of misconceptions, I think, about, you know, who's homeless and, and what the causes are. And of course, we're going to dive into the second part or but that whole question in a bit. But I want to start by just asking, why do you think this has become such a hot button issue? And why does it seem like so little progress has been made in solving homelessness in the US? Hmm. Yeah, what a question. Um, I mean, I think um, there's a simple incongruity here, yeah. right? We, we live in a time of intense wealth concentration. And so in terms of why is this issue salient, I think a lot of folks, when they look around the world, um, there's there's a pretty obvious question to be asked about how is it that something like GDP as an indicator continues to rise uh, and and the country continues to uh, grow its output and, and concentrate wealth in such an extreme manner, ultimately, uh, and 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 yet uh, folks are living on the street, right? How, how is it possible that we've come to a point like this? So, so I think, I think, I think there's, a, there's an incongruity argument to be had. And, and then I think there's the simple fact that, um, you know, folks tend to see their own environments, right? We only tend to experience the cities and the towns in which we live. And, and, and you know, so your question about what does it mean to experience progress on this front? Why does it seem like the problem is getting worse or getting better? Um, you know, the, the national picture is relatively clear, mm -hmm. um, but each local picture is going to be different, right? And, and I think it's um, complicated by the fact that the pandemic has necessarily exacerbated a lot of the housing shortages and housing challenges that we've observed. And so um, over time, and certainly over the past couple of years, I, I think the issue has become incredibly difficult to get a handle on, right, as a function of like reality. Right. So um, I guess then let's talk about some of the root causes, because that's really the heart of your book. And I think kind of the most interesting thing that you guys get at. Um, you point out that people often misdiagnose the root causes of homelessness, right? So obviously, you know, from the right, we'll hear that homelessness is the result of like drug addiction or, you know, just plain laziness or, you know, people, you know, who can't get their lives together. Um, and then on the left, we'll, you know, you'll hear something like homelessness is obviously the result of poverty or low, low wages or evictions and high rent. And um, I think what's really interesting about your book is you really kind of pull apart uh, what you call precipitating events and also root causes. And you guys argue that it's really important to, to diagnose exactly what these root causes are and that a lot of what people think are root causes are not actually the root causes. So um, maybe talk a little bit about what you see as the root causes. And then following from that, what does it mean to take a structural account of homelessness? Sure. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's a really important distinction and it undergirds uh, the, the, the premise of this book. Um, Lots of people lose their housing in the country. Yeah. Um, it's true. And lots of people retain their housing, right? Not everybody who uh, lives in poverty or, or with a substance use disorder necessarily loses their housing, right? Mm -hmm. So, so there's, there's this fundamental question to be asked about when somebody does, right? When somebody experiences a bout of homelessness, um, why indeed have they lost their housing? Um, it's true that if you interview folks, as as is the case every year when uh, the the when housing and urban development mandates the collection of these types of data, right, the one night homelessness census, the point in time count, it's true that when you interview folks experiencing homelessness and you ask them, well, why did you lose their housing, uh, they're likely you know to list a, a handful of the reasons you just named, yeah. right? Oh, well, I had a divorce, mm -hmm. or uh, you know, I had an, an argument with family or friends, and and um, it's, it's true, and it's certainly true in, in these people's experiences, that when those precipitating events occurred, they no longer had housing. Um, 
but it's it's just as true that if there were more housing available, if they had another housing option, it wouldn't have resulted in their experiencing homelessness, right? And so we, we want to ask a, a slightly different question uh, with this text, not just why is somebody losing their housing today? We also want to know why is housing not available to them today? And, and so you can see there's kind of this orientation toward a, a, a supply consideration at hand. But, but more importantly, we're less interested in individual people per se. We, we want to know what differentiates a city like Seattle from a city like Chicago, mm-hmm. right? These are two thriving metropolitan hubs. Uh, and, and yet one of them, Seattle, has four or, five, four or five times the rate of per capita homelessness as Chicago does. Right. So, so is it because there are simply more people uh, with substance use disorders living in Seattle? Is it because there are more people with extremely low incomes living in Seattle? And the answer is no. And, and mm-hmm. we can talk about this later. But right. it, it, if you seek to explain regional variation, if you seek to ask a question about the difference between cities, it turns out that these commonly held perceptions about what quote unquote causes homelessness do not explain that variation. And, and so cannot, <laughs> cannot uh, uh, offer a causal <laughs> Uh, explanatory driving argument uh, mm-hmm. for why these cities look different in terms of their experiences with homelessness writ large. I think to answer this last question, a structural account would seek to understand those factors, right? It would seek right. to look at cities next to one another and ask about undergirding issues as opposed to asking, uh, you know, why did one person lose their housing and why did another person lose their housing in a different way? Right. Yeah. So so let's then dive into your study because it's really interesting. Um, as you just alluded to, what you guys did is you looked at different factors across different regions in the U.S. and, you know, tried to kind of isolate uh, these supposed causes. Right. So you looked at rates of, you know, substance use. Um, you looked at uh, rates of poverty. Um, talk talk a little bit about your study and what you found, um, what it says about the nature of homelessness in the U.S. today. Yeah, <clears throat> gladly. I mean, Again, the, 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 the goal here is to think about um, what explains regional variation. What mm-hmm. does indeed differentiate a city like Seattle from a, a city like Chicago? And, and so we just run a series of these bivariate analyses, right? We ask, uh, what is the relationship between per capita poverty rates mm-hmm. and per capita homelessness rates? What is the relationship between uh, the, the incidence, or excuse me, the prevalence of uh, severe mental illness and per mm-hmm. capita homelessness, uh, and we we run through a variety of these factors and 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 seek to assess the extent to which any one of them can capture the variance in per capita homelessness across and within cities, right? Across cities, given across space, within cities across time, um, and and it and and the you know the long and short of it is that something like poverty simply doesn't explain this variance. In fact, p- poverty rates are negatively correlated with rates hmm. of homelessness. Um, and, and, and so there are these surprising revelations that uh, really simple analyses can point you toward. Um, what we do find to be the case in terms of expl- explanation uh, is that absolute rents, right, how expensive is your housing market, uh, and, and, and rental vacancy rates, how tight is your housing market, mm-hmm tend to explain variance in, in rates of homelessness from city to city. And, and so there's, there's a core question to be asked then about what, what's so special about the housing market that, and maybe this is, you know, maybe this is uh, uh, an obvious question, one that ought to have arisen before a study like ours, uh, and indeed, of course, it has. Mm-hmm. Um, what is it about housing markets um, and, and, and the intricacies therein that, that act on people's experiences with homelessness. What is it about? How, how do they drive? Can they, can they causally drive structural rates of homelessness in a given city? And if so, how? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so um, expand a little more on that. What did you find about housing markets and, and how they affect different regions and drive rates of homelessness? Yeah, so again, I mean, there are some, there are some relatively straightforward conclusions to be, to be noted right away. The mm-hmm. first of which being, if there are higher rents in a city, it's going to see higher rates of homelessness. Right. Uh, so this is perhaps unsurprising. What's a little, what's a little uh, more surprising is is that when you look at rental vacancy rates, and again, this is effectively the number of 
uh, you know, the percentage of, of units in, in a given city that are rentable at any given point in time. You, you, can, you can look around the world and you can say, well, gosh, it, it seems like there are a lot of uh, vacant properties in my mm-hmm. city. And, and you hear this kind of argument a lot. Actually, there are more vacant properties than there are people experiencing homelessness. It's just mm-hmm. a mismatch. We need to get people into the right units. So, so that type of argument might suggest that uh, the more inefficient your housing market is, the more vacancies you have in that market, the more people uh, you might expect to see experiencing homelessness. And that's, that's just not true. The relationship is in the other direction, hmm. right? Hmm. When, there are, when there are lower vacancy rates in a city, per capita homelessness spikes. And in, and in fact, there's a, there's a pretty well-characterized uh, limit. It's, it's, it's around 4%. If you, if you have fewer than 4% uh, uh, rentable properties, right? If, if at any given point in time, uh, a given city drops below that figure, they tend to see spikes in rates of homelessness. This is known as the natural vacancy rate. And mm-hmm. our, our, our study kind of identifies this number again. You get below 4%, 3.5%, and, and, and these rates spike. And so, so then there's this natural question to be asked again, well, why? Why do we see such a reliable relationship between tight housing markets uh, and, and rates of homelessness? And what might that tell us about the differences right. between these cities? Um, and, and ultimately, we, we make an argument about supply and about right. supply elasticity. What is it about a city that allows it to respond to changes in population, for example? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> I think, you know, when when you kind of drill down to these root causes, that obviously raises the issue of what are the solutions, right? Like you have spent this time kind of figuring out what it is that drives homelessness. So, you know, how do we solve it? Um, what would actually, what kinds of policies would actually address the structural causes of homelessness? Well, again, I mean, we're talking about housing. And, yeah. and so structural causes, uh, I would argue, are those that seek to center housing as a solution. Mm-hmm. You know, that said, right, there, there's, a, there's a big question to be asked in every city around the country. Well, do we opt for something like temporary housing, i.e. Right. emergency shelter? Uh, or are we investing in permanent housing? And, and this can include new construction. It can include... Uh, uh, you know, nonprofit management of housing. It can include things like housing first programs and permanent mm-hmm. supportive housing, right? We would all we consider all of those options to be permanent housing. But this tension between what do you do, temporary housing versus permanent housing, it's a question that cities are grappling with all the time. Yeah. I think it's I think it's an important discussion to have, and and I'm not going to offer a real prescription here because in in, in fact I think what our research would suggest is that that balance between emergency shelter provision. And, and to be clear, building emergency shelter means that people aren't going to be dying on the street, right? right. There, right. There's, there's a public health response to be had here. And, and so, you know, I'm not someone who's going to sit here and say, we don't need any more shelter. We, we have to build, build, build. It, right. This is a function of permanent housing through and through. It's just not true, right? Permanent, permanent housing is the thing that ensures an ultimate, uh, uh, an ultimate sustainable response mm-hmm. uh, to the issue at hand. Um, but but you you need to ensure that folks uh, aren't exposed to the elements, right? right. Especially in a city uh, like Seattle or or in New York, right? It's it's uh, it's awfully cold in the winter in a lot of these right. places, and and so you know this is a long way of saying, I think there ought to be a balanced response, one that uh, is 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 contextually dependent on. Uh, both the the policy environment and and the physical environment of a given space, mm-hmm. um, and it and and it needs to be rooted in housing. Okay, so so that's all that's all well and good. Mm-hmm. How do we how do we build? Right. <laughs> and 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 uh, you know that's that's the question of the hour. In yeah. in in some cities, uh, there's a discussion around the elimination of single family zoning. It's a very interesting discussion. I don't think it's the only discussion to be had. And there are some there are some pilots where you see this happening around the country. It'll be interesting to see how it pans out. Mm-hmm. But there are there are other ways to to open up space and there are other ways to 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 open up units, right? In in Seattle and King County, for example, the county has been buying hotels over the course of the pandemic and converting these old hotels uh, you know to to effectively uh, long-term individual bad shelter facilities mm-hmm. um, with the goal of ensuring that a, folks aren't exposed to the pandemic in congregate living uh, environments, and, and B, that they have space to themselves to think and plan for the future. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, this, this approach to both um, 
personal space and also the decommodification of housing, right? This yes. is ownership of housing on behalf of a county or on behalf of a housing authority, right? Mm-hmm. That kind of thing makes a real difference, both in people's experiences of space and also in terms of the housing market itself, right? The right. price of a unit. Right. And, and so, um, you know, what are the solutions there's a balance between temporary and permanent housing to be had, but there's mm-hmm. there's a bigger discussion to be had about what it means to build and, and open up units. And mm-hmm. and um, you know my my headlines there are we need a lot more money if you're if you're if you're going to build seriously, right? You need a lot more money. <laughs> uh, you need you need the space to do it, and often that implicates zoning. Um, but zoning is not the be all end all of mm-hmm. what constitutes opening up space, and you also need to. Get creative, right? Yeah. And I think the decommodification of housing is is something that helps us get there. Right, right, right. Um, I, I I do want to talk more about that, but first I have to ask you about rent control because that's something that you know always comes up, especially in big cities where obviously you know rent is astronomical. Um, I, you guys, you guys don't talk that much about it, but you do suggest that it's not quite adequate. Adequate. Um, can you talk a little bit more about you know where how you see rent control operating and and why you feel like it's maybe not like the best long-term solution? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I'd go as far as to say it's not the best long-term solution. I think I would say it's not the only solution mm-hmm. at our disposal, right? Sure. right? It's, 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 it's one policy in a bucket of policies, and it's to be balanced against other forces. Um, so for example, rent control uh, you know, does not ensure that somebody who's already sleeping outside uh, suddenly has a bed. Right. Um, and, and so in terms of the emergency response, uh, rent control is an ineffective policy. Mm-hmm. In terms of the permanent response, there's a very nuanced discussion to be had about whether or not rent control ensures that people can remain uh, in, in, in units where they want to live. Um, almost certainly, it does that. What does rent control do to the rest of the market? And I think this right. is where the conversation is more complicated. Um, there, there, there's an argument um, that you know I, I'm not sure I completely agree with, but there's, there's, there's an argument to be had that says something like, Okay, if 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 the economics of the rental market are such that uh, prices do not increase in a manner commensurate with something like inflation uh, or something like cost covering and cost of living adjustments on behalf of landlords, uh, there's a trickle down effect that uh, that suggests you know there 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 it is it is it is. Uh, unsustainable mm-hmm. from the perspective of the of the business owner, right? And unsustainable from per- the perspective of the landlord uh, to continue um, um, offering units in a manner that can ensure that they can keep their own unit, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can point at something like rent con- rent control and say. Um, well, this this sounds really good, but if we're talking about new development, it's really hard to get affordable units to pencil uh, with with this policy on the table. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, we need to be you know thinking about uh, some some slightly more complicated math uh, for for the development to work out, right? The new yeah. construction to work out. So, uh, you know, this this was a long way of saying um, I'm I'm personally a, a fan of the mm-hmm. policy. I mm-hmm. think rent control, when well applied. Um, can can do fabulous things, and I and I also think that um, it is it's one tool in yeah. uh, a much more uh, much more uh, varied policy bucket. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So 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 maybe let's um, talk more about the decommodification of housing um, because I think that's really important. Um, what role do you think the creation of, say, like European style public housing can play in kind of alleviating uh, some of these problems with unaffordable rents and mortgages and and, you know, homelessness that we see here in the U.S.? Yeah. Gosh, what a question. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's 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 a cultural question to be asked yeah. there as well. And in, and in fact, I, I'm not even sure we need to uh, go to the European model per se. Mm-hmm. We, we've seen examples of, of other approaches to public housing in the United States that we that we no longer tend to apply. Right. I'm thinking mm-hmm. of like single single room occupancies, for example, uh, or or. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, there are like a handful of like congregate living, uh, mm-hmm. approaches that we've taken in the past. I, I think, I think the main point to be made is, is that public housing in the United States does not need to look like Cabrini Green, 
Sure. Pub- yes, pub- exactly. Right. I, I think when people hear that phrase, public housing, it means something very specific and, and for and for good reason. Right. There there have been missteps in the past. And and, and I think that in, instead, however, um, and, and perhaps the European model that you named is, is one of them. There are just many other approaches uh, to public subsidy of 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 living yeah. <laughs> of of housing affordability um that that could 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 lend a real hand here mm-hmm. um you know i'd mentioned i'd i'd mentioned the purchasing of hotels for example that's 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 one approach right you're you're taking units uh that aren't being used right these are vacant units they mm-hmm. wouldn't be considered such uh under the census because they weren't quote unquote housing in the first place but it's space it's livable space uh and you're taking it out of one market, you are decommodifying it uh, mm-hmm. and ensuring that it is available uh, to people who need it. That right. that general principle uh, is is one that can be applied uh, to many other situations, mm-hmm. right? And and you know, there's 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 I think an important um, point to be made around vouchers as well. Uh, when when we think about decommodification, I mean, this is a big word. What does it mean? Does that yeah. mean that housing is free? Um, I, you know, under some definitions, maybe doesn't mean public ownership under some definitions, maybe right. I'm using it in, in, a, in a, in a slightly more general manner. I'm using mm-hmm. decommodification to suggest that the participant in the market is not experiencing that housing asset, that quote unquote housing asset in the same way that they would were that housing asset subject to the traditional market forces it, mm-hmm. it usually experiences. So, so I would, I would argue that. The expansion of housing choice vouchers uh, is is a step toward decommodification insofar as even though someone is uh, participating in a private market when 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 they come to something like housing, um, their experience of that market is not as dependent uh, on, on, on the forces uh, that it would be were they not holding that voucher. Right. Uh, yeah, you guys have a great line in your book where you say something like housing markets sh- or like housing should not be treated the same as an iPhone or something. I really liked that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And 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 because it's not. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? It's not it's not an iPhone. We can't yeah. we yeah, as much as we would love to, we can't live in iPhones. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, and um housing is also this thing that in terms of uh, construction, for example, and technology, uh you know, the core constituent components it, it hasn't really changed that much right. over the past century. I mean, we hear a lot about, well, what about modular housing? What about like <laughs> building housing from shipping containers? I mean, <laughs> right. they're like, let's, let's 3D print a house, you know, like by all means. And, and also <laughs> a lot of the housing stock in the country is, is quite old mm-hmm. uh, and it's probably going to stay that way mm-hmm. for, yeah. the, for, for the near term. Um, and, and so, you know, there are steps to be, taken to ensure the affordability of that old housing, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, energy efficiency um, uh, investments among them. Uh, But but ultimately, housing is not like an iPhone, not least because uh, iPhone technology has rapidly improved over the past decade. And and the corresponding economies of scale uh, have been produced accordingly, right? iPhones have gotten, well, you know, this is this is a dangerous statement, but I was going to say iPhones have gotten a lot cheaper over time. Mm. Some some of them have. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and certainly a lot of the constituent components have. That is not true of construction right now. Mm-hmm. So I, I want to turn to some of the kind of thornier political questions now, um, because I think uh, I think something that's on a lot of people's minds right now is like, what, why can't blue cities adequately address homelessness, right? And I want to point out that, you know, in your book, you obviously make clear that it's not just a function of these cities being blue. There are plenty of blue cities that don't have homelessness problems or don't have them to the extent that you see in San Francisco, uh, Seattle, Los Angeles, and so on and so forth. Um, but I do want to bring up this political question because it, it does kind of seem like if you have a blue city, the city leadership is theoretically more open to things like the housing first approach. And yet at the same time, you still have these you still have this massive problem. So uh, what what exactly is going on here? I, I think that question is is a is a perfect illustration. I mean, I think that the, the housing first example is a, is a perfect example mm-hmm. uh, to, to illustrate the broader point here, which is just because you don't see uh in investment solving the problem does not mean that investment doesn't work. 
Right. And 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 I, I think housing first exemplifies this insofar as there are reams of evidence that suggest the housing first model works. And by works, I mean ensures that folks have permanent housing mm -hmm. after an experience with housing first, right? Retain that permanent housing. Do not return to homelessness, mm -hmm. uh, you know, within six months or 12 months or 24 months. We know that housing first works. And so, so you know, one, one kind of corollary of your question here is, well, why doesn't it work in a lot of cities? <laughs> it works on the books. Why doesn't it work in cities? Mm -hmm. And uh, my answer is twofold. One, it doesn't work if you don't scale it, right? It, 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 it doesn't work. Uh, you cannot solve a hundred person problem by putting 10 people in units, right? Right. So, so to suggest that something like Housing First doesn't work um, and, and, and also to acknowledge that it is severely underfunded in all cities in mm -hmm. the country, uh, you know, is, is to um, necessarily invoke kind of a contradiction here. Yeah. Uh, it, it does work, but it is underfunded. The other point I would make is that housing first and, and, and you know, there are, there are a couple different conceptions thereof, but I'm, I'm using it to connote something like rapid rehousing right now, mm -hmm. wherein, again, you support someone's rent. You as a government help somebody pay rent, maybe for six months, maybe for eight months. There's there's some means testing going on. The goal is that a lease is in, uh, you know, a, a participant's name. Uh, and they take over, uh, they retain that lease at the end of the program, you know, after they've had six or eight months or 10 months, uh, you know, to increase their incomes, for example. Mm -hmm. That that proposal, right, this, this notion of somebody with an extremely low income receiving a means tested, tested rent subsidy and then taking over the lease at the end of the program, that doesn't work in, in cities with extremely high rents. Right. <laughs> it just doesn't. It, 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 it's a lot easier for rapid rehousing uh, to to work in a city where where you know median rents are a thousand dollars or or six hundred dollars as opposed to two thousand uh, dollars because it's a lot easier to increase one's income you know from let's call it a uh, hundred dollars a month uh, to a thousand dollars a month than mm -hmm. it is to increase one's income from a hundred dollars a month to twenty five hundred or three thousand dollars a month. Mm -hmm. So, so housing, housing first, uh, works in a lab, right? <laughs> it right. works in academia. Mm -hmm. Um, it doesn't work, uh, when we don't effectively implement it. It doesn't right. work when we don't spend enough to ensure that it scales and it, and right. it, and it doesn't work, uh, when, when we throw people to the dogs, when, yeah. when we cut off the subsidy, uh, after, after a, a short period of time. So I think just to wrap up, I, I, I want to ask you, you know, uh, trying to cut through kind of the, you know, political noise, uh, where do you see the most promise for putting together a political coalition to fight homelessness today? Wow. Yes. It's you. My response is rooted in uh, one of your earlier questions, which is around how politically charged this discussion is. <laughs> Has become. It's very difficult to imagine what a winning coalition uh, on, on on homelessness looks like. But yeah. I, I think, in in my estimate, it it, it looks something something like this. It, it depends on uh, the the shifting of of perceptions, right? But I don't think that the shifting of perceptions um, is 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 such a such a grand thing to ask for. And mm -hmm. and in particular, I have a lot of conversations with business owners in Seattle, uh, with, with academics, with educators, uh, with, with, with policymakers, right. You know, with, with my friends and, mm -hmm. and, and, and with people with whom I disagree and, and at the, at the core of most of these conversations is a shared understanding that it doesn't need to be this way. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and in fact, uh, in conversations with all the people I just described, and people experiencing homelessness, with whom I also have these conversations, there's there's a shared understanding that says, in addition to it not having to be this way, uh, people don't necessarily want to be sleeping outside. Right. And and so, what does a winning po political coalition look like? I think it's one that takes those truths uh, at at heart, um, and 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 then kind of works backward to a point of finding. Uh, the the root cause in question, right, and and the, by extension the root solution in question, um, you know, in in practice, what does that mean? Uh, 
Well, it means that urbanists, you know, progressives, uh, need to hear the concerns of business owners and developers. It is too expensive to build in the United States. Uh, and also, business owners and, and developers need to uh, hear the concerns of, of progressives uh, that it may, be, it may be true that um, the private market uh, can develop a certain amount of market rate housing, and that also the private market may not be incentivized. It may not be uh, that which provides the incentive structures right. uh, to produce enough affordable housing for everyone else. And, and, and that maybe uh, there's, <laughs> there's, there's room for other modes of development and other modes of ownership. Right. Um, I don't know if, 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 if that's a little pie in the sky, but I, 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 I think um, what, what feels like it generates possibility in my mind is, mm-hmm. is the fact that many of the West Coast cities uh, you described um, and, and with which I'm most familiar really do feel to be reaching a kind of breaking point. And, and uh, this political breaking point, um, I think, can be read with pessimism. But I think it can also be read as, as a moment of opportunity where, where, where much is laid bare. Uh, and, uh, you know, with, with sufficient political will, uh, a solution becomes possible. We have we have numbers on the table. <laughs> yeah. We just need to we just need to agree about uh, committing to those numbers. All right. Again, Clayton Aldern is the co-author with Greg Colburn of the new book "Homelessness Is a Housing Problem." We will link that in the description box below. Clayton, thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, Jen. If you like this video from the Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.